the prince that brings true peace. The prince that brings true peace. In other words, what we're really focusing on is, is right now in your life, I, I want to encourage you that you can have peace on earth. Would anybody like that today? Would you like peace on earth? Would you like peace in your home? Would you like peace on your job? Would you like peace in the church? You know, I, I want to start out by asking a question this morning. How many of you are finished with your Christmas shopping? You can raise your hand. Okay. Now, how many of you are going to rush right out after church to go finish your Christmas shopping? Anybody? I, I didn't think we'd get a lot of hands raised on that one. But um, how many of you have regifted a present this year? <laughs> hey, anybody ever regift? It's okay if you regift a, pre- a present because it, that means you're following good stewardship principles. Some of y'all is like, what is he talking about? No. Man, I just want you to think, talking about Christmas shopping. <clears throat> Christmas shopping is chaotic. It can be chaotic, especially if you wait until the last minute and try to go on Christmas Eve. Can I get an amen? Anybody ever try to do that? So, <laughs> many years ago, when I was still a youth pastor, and um, we lived outside of Norman, Oklahoma, and Beck, Beck and I were dating, and... and I kind of was coming to the conclusion that I need to, like, uh, you appreciate this. You need to, I need to lasso this girl. I need to tie her up. And, and, and I, oh, that didn't sound right. <laughs> but I need, to, I need to lock this thing in permanently, right? Some of y'all, that was, yeah, erase that. Can you erase that from the video? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> but I need to lock this thing in permanently. And so a few weeks before you know Christmas, we had gone up to the mall and, and caught up to K Jewelers, and we were looking at rings. And I was like, "So, if just I so happened to ask you to marry me, you know, would you? What would you say? And you know, could you show me kind of some things? You know, because I don't like have this rejection thing. I don't want to ask and just be rejected, man. That's a bad deal. You invest that time buying the ring and looking for the ring, and then you present the ring. I don't think so. So anyway, she said that. She would really like this one, and, and I think she knew what I was getting at. So I had decided that on New Year's Eve, I was going to propose to her. And so, so I saved some money, filled out the, the K Jewelers credit application thing, knew that I was going to be able to get some credit to be able to afford this thing, and um, I figured out how I was going to pay it back. And so on December 24th at 6 o'clock, I made my way up to the mall. And I called my mom. Hey, mom, guess what? This is what I'm thinking about doing. Is that cool? What, what do you think? And she's like, if this is what you want to do. I said, yeah, this is what I want to do. So I go in the mall. It's ridiculous. And this is not like Tulsa Mall. This is like just Norman Mall, like really small. And it is crazy. And if you don't think I had anxiety for wanting to go buy this ring... Like, I honestly thought that I was going to have a heart attack. Not because of the price of the ring or, or even the process of buying the ring, but there's all these people around, and I'm thinking, before I get buyer's remorse, I need to get up there quickly so I can buy this thing. It was chaotic. And friends, here's the thing. I know we're in a Christmas season, I know we're holiday season, whatever, we go shopping and we try to do all this stuff. But what I'm finding is that there, more times in our life, our life is chaotic and our life is a mess. And it's not just Christmas time that does it to us. Are you, are you with me this morning? Some of you this morning have health issues that you're going through. Some of you uh, have financial issues that you're struggling with. Some of you have family issues that you're struggling with. Some of you... It's supposed to be a Merry Christmas, but when your family gets together, it's going to be more like a Jerry Springer Christmas. Huh? You know, last week when I was preaching, I was, I was talking a little bit about uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And, and man, when you watch that movie, all kinds of hell breaks loose in that family's life. Amen? You know, just... Uh, he puts up all the lights and he thinks that they're going to work and then he plugs it in and all of a sudden it works. Hallelujah, glory. And then within a matter of moments, 
they stop working. Anybody ever had that happen to you? That's why I'm still struggling to put Christmas lights up. Because I'm like, man, if I put all this stuff up, is it going to work? You know, I was driving by somebody's house last night in our neighborhood where we live. And I was really thinking about going and getting one of those blow-up things. But then three out of the four houses that i seen that had these blow-up things, you know what they were? They were all inflated, but they were laying face down. Why do you invest and spend all that time and all that energy and all that money setting up a blow-up Santa Claus or a blow-up Frosty the Snowman for the wind to come sweeping down the plains and to lay it flat on its stomach? Why? It's ridiculous. But friends, this morning, chaos and a life out of order and a life out in a mess is unfortunately It's not the exception, but it's the norm. Are you here this morning? Are you with me this morning? Turn your Bibles, if you can, to uh, Isaiah chapter 6, or chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse, I want to land in verse 6, because what you see is that there's, there's a few different names given and prophesied by the prophet Isaiah about someone that was coming. And let me give you a little hint. That someone has already been here. And that someone is still here and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And over 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, the prophet Isaiah says these words. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born. And if you have a Bible this morning, I want you, if you can, to physically underline or physically circle the word us. Because let me tell you, Jesus came for you. Jesus came for me. It was a very personal thing. It wasn't an accidental thing. For unto us a child is born. And if you didn't get it the first time, he says, to us a son is given. And what? The government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And the fourth, he would say... He is called the Prince of Peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. For some, it's so great that he's called a wonderful counselor. For some, it's, it's wonderful that he's called a mighty God. For some, it's, it's great that he's called the everlasting Father. But what I find in my life more often than not, and what I think you find in your life more often than not, you need the Prince of Peace. Because if you don't have the Prince of Peace, you can't get to the wonderful Counselor Fitz. If you don't have the Prince of Peace, you can't get to the Everlasting Father. You can't get to the Mighty God. It all starts at the foundation of having peace in your life. Today I see people that have no peace. As a pastor at church, of a great church and wonderful people I see in Christendom, People that are stressed out all the time. They have no peace. I see in Christian marriages, and you think that in Christian marriages that everything should be all high and pie in the sky. But unfortunately, statistics tell us that there's more, almost as much divorce within the Christian marriage as there is in the secular marriage. In the marriages without Christ, there's the same statistical divorce rate as in those marriages of people that are supposedly Christ followers. Friends, that is a problem. You may say it again. That's a problem. If we can't have peace in our marriages, therefore we're not going to have peace in our homes. And then if we don't have peace in our marriages and peace in our homes, then we're raising kids that have no peace. And then when those kids go out of the house and those kids get married, and then guess what happens? In their marriages, they have no peace. Why? Because they were raised in the confines, in the context of a marriage that had no peace. They were shown how to live without peace. They were shown that it was a normal thing. And then when they get married, their houses have no peace. And then when they have kids, they raise those kids. Then those kids have no peace. And it's a generational cycle after cycle. And we wonder why the family unit in America and the family unit in the world is messed up. Why? Because we have no, say it with me, peace. But here's the good news. Peace, and the one that brings peace has never ever vacated us. He's still here. 
And friends, it's up to you and I to turn our lives. Friends, we need to stop being the landlord of our own lives. Friends, can I say that? We need to stop thinking that we have our lives and we can control it. Because guess what? In your flesh, no, you can't. And I'm not talking just to you this morning. When I get in my flesh, there's that temper thing that rises up and that choleric thing that rises up in me that I can't control on my own. And if I don't have peace, and I'm just going to be honest, ordained or not, when I'm driving down a car and somebody cuts me off, if I don't have the peace of God in my life, then there's a certain finger that's going to go up when I roll down the window. Can I say, Amen, church? And you're looking at me like, Pastor, I can't believe you're supposed to be all high and mighty and on a pedestal and you're supposed to be have it all in order. Well, guess what? I'm still in this earth suit. And until I die and go to glory, I'm still going to wrestle with issues of not having peace. <laughs> some of y'all are like, I'm not coming back to that church because my pastor wants to flip off somebody. Yes, I do sometimes. There's some times that I want to call people flaming idiots. And God says, and then my wife, Pastor Gary, I'm driving down the road and I'm, my blood pressure, my face starts getting red. And she says, now you know, Pastor Gary, you can't act like that. And I'm like, I'm not a pastor right now. Thank God for people in your life that you have accountability with. Amen. So God wants us to have peace. So this morning, what does it mean? This morning, my big idea, very easy, very big, very Big, easy, big idea. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, brings peace. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, brings peace. And you say, Pastor, but my life is still in chaos and my life is still in shambles. What do I do? Let me encourage you as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Get closer to the Prince of Peace. Because when you get closer to the Prince of Peace, somehow, I can't explain it, peace invades our life. I, I can remember the parable that Jesus, or, or the, uh, the story of Jesus. Remember, Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee and, and, and He's with His disciples and all of a sudden a storm comes up on the Sea of Galilee. And I'm so excited because next uh, month when I take my trip to Israel, actually somebody texted me this morning, one of the pastors that I'm going with, he said, good morning, we just want to let you know that the temperature this morning in Israel is a nice 57 degrees. Have a good service. I'm like, praise God. Hallelujah. They said the winters in Israel are a lot uh, uh, warmer than here in the States. And I'm like, hey, that's awesome because I was going to answer my question about how to dress. But when I was thinking about the Sea of Galilee, one of our stops is we're going to take a boat ride. And we're going to have lunch on the Sea of Galilee. And it's going to put me right in the exact same place where Jesus is on the boat with these crazy, lunatic people that live without peace, fishermen and tax collectors and lawyers and doctors. And a storm came upon the water. You know the story. And what happened? Jesus is in the bottom of the boat sleeping. And they are freaking out. They run as fast as they can down to the, to the bottom of the hull of the boat, I guess is what they call it. And they wake Jesus up and say, Jesus, Master, don't you know that there's a storm that is raging outside? And if you don't get up and do something, we're all going to die. And I don't think Jesus was in a hurry that day. I think Jesus got up, put his slippers on, and he slowly makes his way to the top side of the boat and Jesus is standing on the deck of the boat and he's saying hmm is this what you guys are freaked out about it's just a storm and, and I think Jesus said to the disciples don't you know that I'm the master of the wind you know there's a song that used to be sung a long time ago it said I know the master of the wind I know the maker of the rain. If he can calm the storm, make the sun to shine again, I know the master of the wind. And then in a simple statement that I don't think it was televised on Christian television, <laughs> I think Jesus said, Peace. 
Be still. And immediately, the winds and the waves had to stop because God gave Jesus the authority to tell it, peace be still. You say, friends, I, Pastor, I, what are you talking about? Friends, if you have a storm in your life, you need to at this time get as close to Jesus as you've ever been in your life because that same Jesus can say, peace be still to your storm, just like he said, peace be still to that storm. Can I get a witness this morning? This morning, I, I just want to break it down a little bit for you if I can. Let me go grab the same notes that you're looking at so I can follow along with you. This morning, I want to break it down because when you look at the word Prince of Peace, what you're going to find out, I want to teach you some Hebrew this morning. You're going to college this morning and you didn't even know it. Here's the best thing about this. You're going to college this morning and you're not even going to have to have the student loan debt. Praise God. I'm going to teach you some Hebrew this morning. Prince of Peace. That word Prince in the Hebrew Follow along with me. It's the word sar, S-A-R. For Jesus was called Prince of Peace. In the Hebrew, the word Prince of Peace is the word sar, shalom. But when you break down just that word prince, it's the word sar. Listen to me. It means the one that's in charge. Jesus is the one that's large and in charge. Friend, It means captain. Did you know that, cap, that Jesus is the captain of the world's greatest largest ever assembled army in human history the army of believers and he's the captain break it down more it means the lord it means the ruler it means the chief it means the general the romans they would use the word sar s-a-r and when the romans would use the word sar s-a-r it became czar c-z-a-r and then Sar went from Tsar, and then for the Romans, it became Caesar, like Julius Caesar. In other words, in Rome, you had to answer to the one that was large and in charge, Julius Caesar. Are you tracking with me? Well, guess what? We have a greater king that's not of this world, and he is the prince. And he's large and in charge of your life, and large and in charge of my life. He is the Tsar. Now, Tsar Salome. The Hebrew word shalom, or shalom, depending on how you read it, means rest. It means tranquility. It means wholeness. It means, listen to this, if Jesus, if, if Jesus is called the prince or the sar or the captain, that's what the word prince means. Remember, I just told you that. Chief, captain, commander, ruler. But if he's the captain, now add peace, which is shalom, which means rest. Guess what that means for your life? That Jesus is the captain of your rest. Is that cool this morning? Does that do something for you this morning? That when Jesus comes into your life, all the chaos at Christmas time, all the chaos in the family unit, all the chaos at the job, you need to stop and say, I submit my life to the captain that provides rest. Amen? Now, does that mean that if, if, if Jesus is the captain of rest and if Jesus is the prince of peace, does that mean that we can do every, anything and everything in our life and still have the peace of God? No. Because whenever you do something outside the lordship of Jesus Christ, it brings chaos and it brings disorder. But if you're living a life out of chaos and are living your life out of peace right now, you need to ask the question, am I living outside the confines of how Jesus wants me to live? Are you with me this morning? Because what I find in my life and what I think you can find in your life is most of the times when our lives get out of balance, it means we've stepped away, or as the book of Revelation, the Apostle John says, we've left our first love. You made a conscious decision to turn around and leave it. You didn't, maybe you didn't mean to. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe you didn't even think about the consequences. But if your life is in chaos right now, Maybe you're not as close to the captain of rest or the prince of peace that you need to be. Are you tracking with me this morning? God is the prince of peace. So how does that work in our lives? I just want to share a few things this morning. Four to be exact. If that's okay. Are you okay with that? 
All right. So, these two words that we're putting together, Sar Shalom, which is Jesus is the Prince of Peace. What does that mean for our life? If Jesus is the peace, what does that mean for our life? Number one, it's on the screen behind me. Write it down. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, can surpass all of our human understanding. See, what you have to understand is that when Jesus came on the scene, the peace of God arrived on the scene even when everybody else didn't want it to. Think about it. Jesus was born. And guess what? King Herod wanted to kill Jesus. Do you remember that story? King Herod didn't want the Prince of Peace to come on the scene. And then guess what? Then Jesus grows up. Then Jesus starts to do ministry. And all those religious zealots and, and all those Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes, all those people didn't want to even listen to the message of Jesus. The message that Jesus preached, the message of peace and the message of wholeness and the message of healing, people were saying, well, why did you heal on the Sabbath day? Why didn't you just pick another day to heal this lady? Healing's great, but I would have done it this way. Friends, peace came on the scene even when the world didn't want it to. Friends, you know what I find sometimes is that we say that we want peace, but we really don't. Because if we really did want peace, then we would do the things that would bring peace to us. And that means get into a closer relationship with Jesus. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. How close is your walk with Jesus this morning? You say, Pastor, I'm, I'm living not at peace, but how close is your walk? Amen? It surpasses our human understanding. The Prince of Peace, listen to this, was born in a manger because there was no place at the end. But Jesus is born and peace is now the embodiment and he's present with us in this real and tangible way. You know why when Jesus came on the scene, the Prince of Peace came on the scene, you know why it really wasn't accepted very well? Because the world system thought they could handle it themselves. It was during this time that, that, that the Roman Empire was going through the period of Pax Romana, which was the long period of relative peacefulness and minimal expansion by the Roman military of the Roman Empire. It was established by Caesar Augustus. Its span was 206 years, 27 B.C. or 27 before Christ to 180 A.D. So it was during this time period that Jesus Christ comes on the scene so the world doesn't think that they need this peace. Just like them, sometimes we don't think we need it. But friends, this peace, and I want to, I want to leave you with this verse on this point. Philippians 4, 7. The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. It doesn't make sense. Friends, there's many times in my life, more than I care to admit, that I wonder why God would choose me. Why would God use this guy? It blows my mind. It doesn't make sense. I'm not the smartest book on the shelf I'm not the sharpest tool in the toolbox man there's, there's many other people I have friends that can preach circles around me and you love to hear them probably more than you're hearing me this morning and sometimes I get intimidated by that when I turn on the television and, and I, see, I see these preachers and, and they're preaching they go up there they take nothing with them not even a bible not even notes and they just preach and I'm like man they must have some photographic memory or something but you know what? God says, you know what? I'm going to use you. And, and it's good because when you think that you can do it, then that means that I'm not in it. See, when you, however, when you turn your life over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you know that you can't do it and he has to do it, that's what I'm talking about, about surpassing all human understanding. So the peace of God, the Prince of Peace, the Sar Shalom, Surpasses all human understanding. The second thing, back to Isaiah chapter 9. The, the peace of God brings light into the darkness. Look at verse 1, Isaiah chapter 9. But there, watch this, Isaiah's prophesying, there will be no more gloom for her. Talking about Israel. For she was in anguish. 
In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the sway of the sea on the other side of Jordan in the Galilee of the Gentiles. But I focus on that first part of that verse. But there will be no more gloom. Friends, I'm preaching the message this morning that if you're living in gloom, Jesus has come and he says, I am the Prince of Peace. And Jesus has come to bring light to your darkness. So step out of the gloom and step into the light that Christ offers this morning. Jesus said, I've come. Notice that in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, I don't have time to go there, but you can when you go home, write it down. It was in the darkness of the night that an angel appeared to the shepherds. And it's that same light that appeared to the shepherd is the same light that appears to you and me today. Remember what the shepherd's uh, uh, response was when the angel came. What was their first response? It was the response of what? Fear. This angel's going to come down and kill me. But guess what? The angel said, do not be afraid. This morning, I don't know what you're about to step into. I don't know what God's calling you to do in your life. I don't know what God's calling you to do in this church. I don't know what's going on in your job. I don't know what's going on in your family. I don't know what's going on in your finances. But Jesus Christ is stepping into the darkness and he's saying, do not be afraid because I got this. All you got to do is plug into me. Friends, here's the, here's the thing. And I already told you crazy stories about when I try to do electrical work. I about kill myself sometimes. But friends, these lights this morning are working. Why? Because there is a power source that goes from the main box. And it's ran through, this I know, ran through conduit from the main box all over this building. And this conduit, guess what? Has wires going through it. Friends, can I tell you this morning that if you're living in gloom, you need to put your wires wrapped in conduit and you got to attach them to the power source. You got to attach it to the mainframe. You got to attach it to the breaker that will never trip or the breaker that will never blow. And that is Jesus Christ. Because he brings light into darkness. So Jesus, the Prince of Peace, surpasses our human understanding, brings light into darkness. Let me give you these last two. The third one. Some of you need this this morning. I know. Jesus is the one. The Prince of the Peace is the one that comforts you. How many of you need comfort this morning? You don't have to raise your hand, but if you need comfort in your life, i got a scripture for you. John 14, 27. The words of Jesus. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. Whose peace does he give you? He said, my peace I give to you. Notice it's not your peace. <laughs> Notice it's not the church's peace. Notice it's not your denomination's peace. Notice it's not, it's not any man-made peace. Jesus said, it's my peace. See, friends, Jesus knew who he was. And it's about time some of us as believers know who we are. Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. It's not a peace like the world gives. And then he goes on, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And what? Do not be afraid. Whose peace does Jesus give to you? He gives his peace. It's the peace of the one who's in charge that brings the rest, that brings the shalom. He gives you his peace. Some of you right now this morning, life is just going haywire. There's no inward peace. But listen to the words of this humble preacher this morning. He's come to give you peace. Not as the world gives. Friends, see, a lot of times we try to have this peace and find this peace in a, in a bottle. We try to find this peace in a, a bottle of pills. We, we try to think that if we just hit the right slot at the casino and I win all this money, that all, all the peace that I'm going to have. We try to have our peace in all these other things than the true peace, and that's finding it in Jesus. Amen. Jesus wants to comfort us. Finally, the peace surpasses all human understanding. The, the peace brings light into the darkness. The peace comforts us, and finally, it's the peace that saves you. Jesus is the peace that saves you. 
Jesus is the peace that brings salvation. Remember what I had told you uh, a few weeks ago, that Jesus, the word Jesus means Joshua. The word Joshua means salvation. So Jesus is the Old Testament alliteration of the word Yeshua. And we have this Joshua Jesus, the one who brings salvation. This morning, Jesus saves us. This morning, you feel like you're going to go to the edge of the cliff and, cliff and jump off. Some of you feel that way. But guess what? Jesus is there with a net. And he's going to catch you when you jump. Jesus this morning is there to catch you even before you go over that edge to where you don't even need a net because he's the one that saves you. Notice what scripture says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. Friends, this morning it's not because we've been justified by our good works. It's not because we've been justified by our religious efforts. It's not because we've been justified by our good deeds, but it's because we've been justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. And friends, when we have a connection to Jesus Christ, when we are justified, it's in that and in that alone that we can have this peace that Jesus brings. Friends, you're not a good person. That's why you are bent to when you step outside of the will of God to do things that aren't very good because you're not a good person. You say, that's hurtful. Well, we're in the flesh. We're not good people. Amen? We think that we are. But when we allow the devil to get a hold of us, we do stupid, dumb things. Amen? Can we affirm that? But guess what? When we are justified by faith, I love the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, that, that, when I die and go to glory, besides Jesus, there's two people that I want to sit down with. Well, actually, besides Jesus and my Father, there's two other people. I want to sit down next to the Apostle Peter. I'm Peter. I am stick my size 12 in my mouth any chance I can get. I speak before I think. And then I, and then I want to sit down with the Apostle Paul. I had so much zeal and passion. But the Apostle Paul said things like, the good that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I want to refrain from, I find myself doing. And friends, that's me sometimes. There's times that I, that I want to press towards the goal and, and, and I know what the goal is and then there's something that comes over me and I get lazy about it and I go the other direction. I can relate to those two guys. But here's the thing. We're not good enough. But praise God, I know one who is. His name is Jesus. And he's good enough for you. And he's good enough for me. So this morning, if you have your talk notes at the bottom of your page, there's an area on there called Next Steps. You say, Pastor, what do I do with what you've preached this morning? Friends, this is what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself, are you at peace with God through Jesus Christ? Because that's where you start. That's your, that's your jumping point. That's where you, everything begins. You say, Pastor, yeah, I've had a relationship with Jesus, but it's not very, very good. Maybe you need to come back. And as the old ministers of the gospel used to say, do your first works again. Get saved. Or rededicate. If you're not, choose to take that next step and enter into a relationship with Jesus. If you had to describe your normal state, what is it? Is it very peaceful? Is it mostly peaceful? Are you occasionally stressed right now? Are you very stressed? Are you off the charts, high strung and anxious? Man, if you went home today, could you just sit down and have private communion time with the Lord? Or do you have to have all this other stuff going on? And you say, Pastor, I've got to cook dinner. Or, Pastor, I've got to do this. And I've got to clean the house. Or, Pastor, I've got to go shopping. Or, Friends, sometimes you just need to stop and put all that stuff on the back burner. And you just need to sit down and have quiet, peaceful time with the Lord. 
Sometimes your family, you just need to turn off the telephone, cell phone. You need to turn off the television. Just start a fire in your fireplace. And you just need to sit there. And you need to have a Moses burning bush experience with the Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray with you this morning.